This video is brought to you by Full Sail University. What's up, everybody? Michael here. Now, today we're talking about the show that's convinced me to never attend a superhero orgy, ever, no matter what. This most recent season of The Boys has been both chaotic and wildly compelling. And if Homelander's recent antics have shown us anything, it's that Kanye was right. No one man should have all that power. But it's not just Homelander and his new radioactive daddy whose lives are defined by power. It's all of them. Whether they're as helpless as Huey or as formidable as Starlight, every single player is being forced to play the same power game. So why are all of these characters so obsessed with power? And can the power struggles in the boys teach us something about how power functions in our own societies? Let's find out with a little help from some French philosophers. Frenchie would be so proud of us. Oui, monsieur. Welcome to this wisecrack edition on the boys. Is power going to kill us all? And of course, major spoilers ahead for the latest season of The Boys. But before we get into it, I wanna shout out this video sponsor, Full Sail University. Full Sail offers associates, bachelors, and master's degrees in the fields of technology, arts, media, and entertainment. And they just launched a new bachelor's degree in game, business, and esports, which can help students enter the industry from different perspectives, from game development to communications and marketing to competitive gaming itself. And this new major joins a roster of other cool fields of study like film production, computer animation, sports casting, and web development. With Full Sail University's accelerated coursework, you can finish your degree in about half the time required at other colleges and universities. Plus, you can complete your classes and coursework online or in person at Full Sail's campus in Orlando, depending on what's right for you. Whatever model you choose, you'll get hands-on, real-world experience in the career path of your choice. Plus, Full Sail accepts new enrollments monthly, so you don't have to build your schedule around traditional semesters. To learn more about Full Sail University's new game, business, and esports majors, or any of their other degree programs, visit fullsail.edu slash wisecrack. That's fullsail.edu slash wisecrack. And now, back to the show. The Boys puts power front and center. Since we're dealing with a world where some people can leap buildings or obliterate an innocent woman in a single bound. But just as importantly, a whole lot of people can't. And all of this sounds in line with Michel Foucault's analysis of how power functions in society. One form of power he identifies, sovereign power, describes the right of those at the top to give and take life. Or to put it more simply, the right to kill. We see a lot of this in modern political philosophy. In this view of power, there's a small contingent at the top who can take all of us out at will, and then we're just down at the bottom hoping that they don't. And ever since A-Train plowed through Huey's girlfriend and Homelander took out an entire plane to protect the company, the boys has been exploring how dangerous this type of sovereign power really is and how those who wield it rarely face consequences. This is why, at least initially, it seems like we're watching a valiant quest by Butcher and the boys to level the playing field by overthrowing the soups and the force of their sovereign power. But as we go further down the Vought rabbit hole, it becomes clear that the power problem isn't limited to the wielding of power by a powerful sovereign, a la what Hobbes and the modern political philosophers talked about. Rather, power is more defined by what Foucault describes as rules according to which the true and false are separate and specific effects of power which are attached to the true. A battle about the status of truth and the economic and political role it plays. In this way, power is something that's sort of everywhere and enacted more than it's possessed. The boys are on a mission to prevent anyone from wielding that type of power ever again. But as we go further down the Vought rabbit hole, it becomes clear that the power problem isn't limited to A-Train and Co. It's everywhere. Along with Starlight, Huey has been the closest thing the show has to a moral compass. We sympathize with him because he's been victimized by multiple members of the Seven, and he's way more compassionate than most of the show's alpha males. Plus, he's just sort of adorable and wears really great t-shirts. But he still lives in a world where value is measured in power. And the A-Train action figures in his bedroom show us that he grew up admiring soups. He desires power, but has spent most of his life without it. And the tension this creates soon starts bubbling up in unpleasant ways, some of which involve intravenous drug use and green puke. Now, Huey's frustration seems to come from a good place. He's watched his loved ones being harmed without being able to help, so he wishes he was stronger. But there's something else going on, and it manifests in his insecurity about dating a soup. His struggle to open a jar threatens his sense of manhood, even when they're safe at home. 
On some level, Huey feels entitled to be more powerful than Starlight simply because he's a man. His sense of worth is derived from how powerful he feels, specifically relative to his incredibly powerful girlfriend. I thought that you didn't care about that. I mean, on our first date, you said that it didn't bother you. I know. But it does. Sometimes. But this isn't just a Huey problem. Society prioritizes power, which we see in the throngs of sad sacks obsessed with Homelander, all getting off on his all-encompassing power. This seemingly harmless but toxic dudeness is exemplified by Todd, a classic nice guy type. He's a glasses-wearing, flannel shirt-clad teacher and caring stepfather and husband. But we learn that underneath the nice guy exterior is a dark obsession with Homelander and his most toxic and violent beliefs. Because he's America's greatest hero who saves thousands of people. He's standing up to the crooks, the corporations, and the legacy media. Hey, you friend me on Facebook, I'll send you some stuff. And I mean, okay, let's just say it right now. Um, in particular, in season three, they're doing a Trump thing. I mean, you saw the taco bowl scene, right? Seriously, we have the best taco bowls right here in the building. Should make you feel right at home, pal. Bienvenidos, muchacho. Trump literally did that. And the whole, I could shoot someone on Fifth Avenue and nothing would happen thing. Where I could stand in the middle of Fifth Avenue and shoot somebody and I wouldn't lose any voters, okay? Well, that happens too. And it goes just about as well as old Don Sr. predicted. Yeah! <laughs> and while Huey doesn't have Todd's dark obsession with Homelander's fascist worldview, he does fall into the same trap of being the nice guy who fetishizes the power of others. The introduction of Temp V allows Huey to experience the physical power that A-Train and Homelander have used to ruin his life. And the transformation is stunning. Formerly peaceful, Huey starts killing people with his bare hands. <laughs> while naked. Oh, oh sh I'm sorry. If I was murdered by a fully clothed man, I would feel a sense of honor. If I was murdered by a naked person, I would feel shame. I'd feel nothing because I'd be dead, but assuming that the afterlife exists and consciousness transcends into the afterlife, I would feel shame. We can better understand what's going on here with another type of power that Foucault talks about, biopower. Foucault describes it as an explosion of numerous and diverse techniques for achieving the subjugation of bodies and the control of populations. Biopower is another mechanism by which societies can control who lives or dies while ensuring the health of a stable workforce. This can look like, I don't know, like governments deciding when life begins and what bodies containing life are allowed to do with them. Sorry, I know that was a super hypothetical example. I'll do a better one next time. And in the world of the boys, both Compound V and Temp V represent advances in a type of biopower by which certain humans literally have more biological power, which they can decide to use to hurt or to help people. So Huey's pacifism, empathy, and loyalty to Starlight all dwindle as soon as he's jacked up on that V. It's almost as if he was just using these virtues as crutches that once empowered, he no longer found useful. I thought the drugs had f***ed you up, Huey, but this is you. This is all you. Luckily, by the end of the season, we learn that Huey isn't, in fact, a total power-hungry piece of sh**. Literally every neuron in your brain is screaming, I told you so, so why don't you just say it before your head explodes? Oh my god! I told you so. But not everyone comes back to the light after tasting some power. And power dynamics aren't exclusive to the men. The show's female characters also find themselves forced to compromise their values if they want to enjoy agency or authority. Take the shameless corporate climber, Ashley. I accept your nomination as CEO of Vought International. <laughs> you know, my mother used to say before she died of cancer when I was 17. Okay, Ashley, that's enough. Let's not bring the room down. Apologies, sir. Having worked her way to the top at Vought, she gets a front row seat to Homelander's brutal corporate culture. But being humiliated every day by those above her doesn't inspire Ashley to change the system or challenge its legitimacy, though it does lead to her ripping out her own hair. Instead, she just soaks up all their abuse and unleashes it on those not as strong as her. The next report you're gonna be doing is inside my Asshole. Putting women like Ashley in positions of power seems like it should challenge the patriarchal culture at Vought. That, at least, is the theory of the lean-in brand of feminism, sometimes called corporate feminism, which has been championed by the likes of former Facebook COO Sheryl Sandberg. 
The thinking goes that women climbing the ranks can change things from the inside, tipping the balance and fundamentally altering sexist power structures. Unlike most third wave feminists, corporate feminism doesn't view capitalism as part and parcel with gender inequality. Rather, it argues that equality comes when capitalism diversifies. It's sort of like saying that, you know, the planet of Alderaan would still exist if the Death Star were pink. In reality, and much like Ashley, Sandberg's been accused of wielding her power in less than savory ways. She reportedly yelled at and intimidated employees when they tried to speak up about Facebook's role in Russia's campaign to influence the 2016 election. And she reportedly failed to act decisively to stop the prolific dissemination of right-wing extremism, racism, and misogyny on the platform. But to be clear, to the best of our knowledge, Sandberg has never been complicit in any murders or kidnapping that we're aware of. On the show, Ashley embraces a type of lean-in feminism, even as she's actively harming the women around her. She ends up mimicking Homelander's example. Is your idiot brain getting by stupid? Is your idiot brain getting by stupid? Several other female characters do the same. Before Homelander went to all Raiders of the Lost Ark on her, Madeline Stilwell was able to hold some sway over the super-powered man-baby, but only by indulging his edible fantasies. Our boy likes to drink that milk. <laughs> Also in this season, he milks a cow to suck its teeth because his edible fantasies transition to farm animals. But, you know, we don't we don't kink shame at Wisecrack. Nope. And Madeline had no qualms with all types of murder and intimidation and bribery as long as it helped her climb the corporate ranks. Even superpowered women are forced to occupy a specific version of the strong woman archetype. When she joins the Seven, Starlight's costume is immediately reinvented to make it more revealing. You know for the fellas. She can be strong just as long as she's also sexy. And while Vought goes out of its way to highlight how empowered its female heroes are with their girls get it done slogan, girls get it done. They always ensure that their vision of a powerful woman does nothing to challenge the authority of the patriarchy. Wow, I'm so honored to be with you guys tonight to celebrate my dear friend and mentor, Homelander. Even when they seem to be acting outside the bounds of conventional gender roles, they're still just playing with power. Yes, do you get it done? Stormfront's whole identity was based around rejecting the traditional feminine qualities of someone like Starlight. This world for confusing nice with good. Be a bitch if you want, be whatever. Just drop the mask once in a while. But this, not like other girls branding, was only skin deep because her casual Nazism still comes in a conventionally feminine package. Yay. It's a lot like the cool girl archetype from Gone Girl, where her subversions are acceptable in so much as they don't challenge gender roles themselves. Also, at the end of the day, she still ends up being Homelander's half-dead H.J. machine. When you lead an army of Aryan Ubermensch to their victory. What? The key thing here is that no matter how high any of them climb, the moment they stop playing along with the powers that be, the moment they improperly express empathy, they can be easily thrown under the bus or tossed into a secret prison or just taken out altogether. This makes any kind of solidarity almost impossible. Vought takes full advantage of the women's disunity when it wants to get rid of Queen Maeve. While positioning her as a symbol of empowered queer womanhood was great for marketing, the moment she starts to speak out, she vanishes. And when Starlight appeals to Ashley's humanity to try and find her, we see a split second of empathy and then... I am CEO. Next time you appointment. From soft boys like Huey to super women like Starlight, what the third season of the show really underlines is how difficult it is to actually take a stand against the types of power that philosophers like Foucault talk about. When describing his theory of biopower, he says that if genocide is indeed the dream of modern power, this is not because of the recent return to the ancient right to kill. It is because power is situated and exercised at the level of life, the species, the race, and the large-scale phenomena of the population. Which means that modern power uses as much force as necessary to maintain the structure of a governable society. Nobody wants innocent people to get hurt, of course not. But sadly, well, the bad guys, they don't think like us. And so, sometimes, well, these things just happen. Now, we can better understand what's going on here by visiting another pair of French thinkers, Gilles Deleuze and Félix Guattari, who we would assume Frenchie has definitely read while in a philosophical K-hole. You know, Jean-Paul Sartre said, marriage 
Stifles are essential male urges. Their work understands modern power via the lens of capitalism and how human desire is structured and then used by capitalism. This allows them to analyze how capitalism seems to be able to suck everything up into its own orbit infinitely increasing its own power and control. According to Deleuze, everything is rational in capitalism, except capital or capitalism itself. The stock market is certainly rational. One can understand it, study it. The capitalists know how to use it, and yet it is completely delirious. It's mad. It is in the sense that we say, the rational is always the rationality of an irrational. This is a key tension of how power operates under capitalism. It makes logical sense, i.e., we can understand how markets and profits work in mathematical terms, but it's also totally bad shit when we realize how these logical systems affect society and human life. It makes logical sense that student loan debt comes with compounding interest, but it makes absolutely no sense that a kindergarten teacher can rack up six figures in growing debt. And we see this in Vought, a publicly traded corporation that makes logical decisions based on how it affects the market and their profitability, even when the reality of those decisions involves murdering innocent humans or experimenting on children and uh, empowering a superpowered psychopath. It's what makes Homelander such a perfect metaphor for this kind of capitalist-fueled power. He's literally bulletproof, able to shrug off any attack, any criticism, any call for accountability. Because at the end of the day, he still has all the power. And as long as his power doesn't contradict the logic of capital, everything is fine. And that's what people who really want to change things are up against. A powerful structure that can logically justify taking you out if you're f***ing with their profits, and that has the biopower to kill you with ease. <laughs> Take the three characters who seemed like they were leading the charge against Vought and Homelander. Starlight, Billy Butcher, and Victoria Newman. They're each taking different approaches to changing things, with Butcher aiming for a violent insurrection, Newman hoping to bring about political change via the democratic process, and Starlight trying to fix Vought from the inside. Now, initially, it seems like they're all making a difference. Butcher is effectively tracking down dangerous superheroes while reining in his most violent impulses. Newman is leading the Bureau of Superhero Affairs to try and keep those with powers within the bounds of the law, and Starlight has been made co-captain of the Seven, seemingly putting her on equal footing with Homelander. It looks like real change is coming, but that idea is quickly set on fire, snapped in half, and stomped into the dirt. And then it gets its head blown up. Newman is revealed to be in Vought's pocket. This makes sense as the corporation is so powerful that it can own everyone on both sides of the political divide, propping up progressive politicians to maintain the impression of a functioning democracy without risking Vought's own authority. Oh, and, and Newman is, of course, also a soup who can blow people's heads up. But hey, um, at least this is just a TV show. You know, it's not like corporate interests would ever have a direct relationship with seemingly progressive politicians that, um, that allowed them to ensure that they stayed in power while pacifying the masses into thinking the politicians were fighting for them, because that'd be crazy, right? Like if politicians took money from the oil industry, the weapons industry, the tech industry, and then they were like, oh no, but we care, we care about you, you know? That's, that's TV stuff. Okay, grow up if you think that's how the world works. That's TV, it's not how the world works. For Deleuze and Guattari, none of this fundamentally contradicts how capital works because ideology doesn't really matter. Only power does. Deleuze says in an interview that ideology has no importance whatsoever. What matters is not ideology, not even the economic ideological distinction or opposition, but the organization of power. Because the organization of power, that is, the manner in which desire is already in the economic, in which libido invests the economic, haunts the economic, and nourishes political forms of repression. Okay, this means that underneath a sort of social performance of ideology and politics, like what we see from Newman, is really just a raw desire for power. You have 193 million Instagram followers. Let me your influence and I'll lend you mine. I can protect you from Homelander. You'll finally be team captain for real. And in return, you help me goose my numbers. This isn't just about one politician secretly being corrupt, but a system where power is so concentrated into the hands of corporations like Vought that no one can even enter the game without their say-so. Huey might have thought that he and Newman were making all the right chess moves to take Vought down, but it turns out Vought owned the whole board from the beginning, and Newman was playing along because she gets that it's about power and not ideology. The same goes for Starlight. Going from a simple country girl to the head of the executive table, she's exactly the sort of success story that lean-in feminism craves, living proof that talented and committed women can smash through the glass ceiling and rise to the top. 
Of course, it's quickly revealed that Vought is still underpinned by the same values it always was, namely that they'll say and do whatever makes their stock price go up. Feminism is useful if it's profitable and helps them sell merch, and that's about it. We always seem primed to celebrate individual advancements, individual advancements of black people, people of color, women, without taking into consideration that diversity by itself may simply mean that previously marginalized individuals have been recruited to guarantee a more efficient operation of oppressive systems. On the back of numerous scandals, it is briefly beneficial to Vought to put Starlight front and center to make them look progressive. Again, they are using the power of the media to create a regime of truth that helps maintain their position. But when Homelander tears up the ratings with a maniacal rant about his own innate superiority, fascism comes right back into fashion. I am done apologizing. I am done being persecuted for my strength. You people should be thanking Christ that I am who and what I am because you need me. You need me to save you. You do. I am the only one who possibly can. And none of this would have shocked the Luds, who said that fascism too, one must say that it has assumed the social desires, including the desires of repression and death. People got hard-ons for Hitler, for the beautiful fascist machine. Though now it's not hard-ons for Hitler, but hard-ons for Homelander. And kids, if you thought philosophy was boring, that's a famous French philosopher who wrote the line, people got hard-ons for Hitler. So. Major in philosophy, the one major where you can write a paper that says the phrase hard-ons for Hitler and not get sent to the counseling center. The overarching message of the boys' third season is that the capitalist power structure can adapt to just about anything. In most cases, it can even absorb it outright and find a way to make money off of it. The sick genius of capitalism, according to Deleuze and Guattari, is that since it's fundamentally about the logic of power and desire and not ethics or ideologies, it can suck up anything into its orbit as long as it can help increase profits. Whether it's A-Train's cynical attempt to use the Black Lives Matter movement to propel himself back into relevancy, or the way Vought turns on a dime from forcing Maeve to cover up her sexuality to using her to rainbow wash the company's image, even the things which were specifically created to curtail their power can be sucked up into the big machine and spat back out as consumer products. Starlight realizes this when Newman offers her the latest in a long line of ends justify the means type propositions. She's sick of being drawn into a rigged game and vows to fight from the outside instead. Like one of Deleuze's favorite literary characters, Melville's Bartleby the Scrivener, rather than playing along, Starlight simply says, I would prefer not to, and rejects the system. She also rejects a more sovereign view of power when she uses her Instagram Live to wield power through knowledge and media influence. She realizes it's entirely possible that our French friends were right, that there is no real outside and no way to challenge a system as deeply ingrained as the one Vought represents, but she sure is hell gonna try. Done. I'm not doing it anymore. You're not gonna be doing anything if Homelander kills you. Yeah, maybe. But then I'll know I'm not working with a nut job. Of course, whether she'll be successful is unclear. We already know that incremental solutions just won't work, that the whole system is broken and needs to be completely rebuilt. So long as their lives are defined by a desire for power, they'll only be safe once they have it. And that's the lesson which everyone from Huey to Starlight has been beaten over the head with throughout the third season. And while our friends don't magically dismantle the economic and psychic hold of capitalism by season's end, we do see some rejections of the illogical logic of the system. Huey realizes how utterly effed up his search for power in the Temp V was. And by reflecting on his father's love for him, he realizes that actual strength comes from taking care of those we love. You know what, Dad? Was there. Taking care of me during, during the worst days of his life, just trying to keep the lights on and a, and a roof above our heads. This enables him to throw away the Temp V and use his not decaying brain to very literally empower Starlight to fight fascism. And in doing so, this shows that Huey is rejecting a sort of old school sovereign view of power and enacting a sort of power that he has some control over. And we see Maeve seemingly sacrifice her life to protect others. 
But none of these virtuous or just acts take place within the system of Vought's superhero industrial complex. It's not enough to just get some of the right people further up the pyramid. They won't have any more effect on it than the people sitting next to Homelander. It's about pulling the blocks out from the very bottom and watching it collapse so that we can build something new. But as we see in Homelander's once good-natured son Ryan, some people can't help but be attracted to the power promised by the system. In its exploration of power, both at the biological level of soups who can dominate the rest of humanity and at the level of a larger system, which runs on the cold logic of capital, the boys seems to be pointing to the way in which our own world isn't all that different. Sure, we don't have magical juice that we can shoot up to help us teleport in the buff or superhumans who can laser decapitate a protester with impunity, but we do have corporations working alongside the government to profit off weapons and power social and political figures tapping into populist anger, folks from across the identity spectrum climbing the corporate ladder and crushing the folks below them on the way up, and politicians who are maybe more into good PR. That's why I proposed and, and the House, Nancy, put it in the plan to immediately provide $10,000 in debt relief as stimulus right now. Than they are actually doing the stuff they promised to do when we elected them. And much like the show itself, we're left wondering if those of us without any type of superpower, whether that be strength, money, or influence, are left to get, symbolically at least, run over by those in power. But what do you guys think? Is this sort of imbalance just a fact of life, or can we ever hope to change things? Let us know what you think in the comments. A big thanks to all our patrons for your support. Please don't forget to check out our new Patreon features if you haven't already. And check out our new stream, Wisecrack Live, taking place right here Thursdays at 11 a.m. Hit that like button like you're slamming closed a copy of Lean In. And don't forget to ring that bell and subscribe. As always, thanks for watching. Later. But if, if you know someone, or if you or a loved one have been kidnapped or murdered by Cheryl Sandberg, shout it out in the comments.